All right. If you have your Bibles, turn if you made to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 for continuing the series of messages in that particular book. Uh, I believe it's about two more messages from Colossians after today's message. Of course, our Easter will interrupt the series. Easter is going to be two weeks from the day. Colossians chapter 2. Scripture reading starts with verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Burned with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through faith of the operation of God, who have raised him from the dead. And ye being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have he quickened the devil with him, having forgiven you all trespasses? And blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spored principality and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, moved by your Holy Spirit, this portion of the service. Speak to everybody through your word. Encourage their hearts through this message. Strengthen their faith with this message. Bless them, Lord God. Lord, as not instruction for us to live, but instruction for us to know. And what we can know in this portion of scripture can benefit us greatly. But most important, you be glorified in this message. Be honored and praised through this message. Speak to any online audience through this message. Encourage those that believe on you. Instruct them by your spirit. And save any loss that may view this message. And these things are asked in Jesus' name, your new things. Amen. Okay, we see in verse 9 that the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in Jesus. And when we're talking about the Godhead, we're talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus now possesses the fullness of the divine nature and attributes of God. And he does so, as we see in this scripture, in bodily form. Now, Jesus was fully God and fully man when he was on earth. He was God before he came to earth, and of course, he's God now. And the divine attributes of God, as one scholar said, are in home in Jesus being in him permanently. One of the fundamentals of the Christian faith, the fundamental that we hold to here at Hilltop Bible Church, is the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is fully divine. He's fully man, but fully divine. That he's God, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. And then we see in verse 10 that speaking about the church, that the church of Jesus Christ, including us here today, including any of you that get to see this online in the days ahead, you are complete in him. I want to say that what I'm about to talk to you about cannot happen apart from being in Jesus. Being in Christ, we believers share his life while we're on earth. The term complete means filled. This does not mean that we're filled with the divine essence of God. Rather, it means that we're granted graces, 
that we're granted energies in serving God, that we're granted such things like holiness, righteousness, God's love, spiritual wisdom, and understanding, that these things are worked out in our lives, being in Christ. In Christ, we have put out the power of sin in the flesh, have received new life. We'll be talking a bit more about that. We have been forgiven, and we have delivered, been delivered from the requirements laid down by human traditions, and we've been free from the powers of spirit beings. We are complete in Christ, who the scripture says is the head of all principality and power. Now, Jesus is over all the governments of the world. The Bible teaches that he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. So he is the ruler over all rulers. Now, we know that most of the world does not submit to Jesus now. There will be a time when they will, but not now that they do. But he's still ahead. And he is also over all the angelic beings, both the good angels and the demonic forces. He's over all that. If you recall in the Gospels a number of times when Jesus was casting demons out of folks, they acknowledged his authority. And they told him, don't send us to them, to the Alamos. They acknowledge his authority. All right. Now we see here about a circumcision. A circ in verse 11, a circumcision that is made without hands in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh. This is a spiritual circumcision, one of the heart. Now in the Old Testament, there was a physical circumcision, and that was a seal of a person belonging to the people of God, which in that time was Israel, there was a circum there was a sign that you were part of the covenant, the old covenant with God. This circumcision, however, is a work of God with nothing to do with the human body as such. This occurs when we are born again. The moment that we come to Christ. This circumcision that I am talking to you about this afternoon takes place. It is a cutting off the body of the sins of the flesh, which is a cutting off of that which is unclean and sinful. Now let's keep in mind that when we come to Christ, there is a change. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away. All life to sin, that is, pass away. All things become new. Being in Christ, the believer has repudiated the old nature, which has been put off. That nature does not have the power over them as before they came to Christ. And when we're talking about the circumcision of Christ, we're simply talking about, not talking about the Christ physical circumcision, but that spiritual circumcision that it comes through Christ, that it comes as a result of Jesus saving us from our sins. Now we see about baptism. And the baptism that is mentioned in verse 12 is the baptism in the Holy Spirit, of which the water baptism is an outward expression of. Now, we here at Hilltop Bible Church believe in water baptism by immersion. We believe that that is a better picture of what happens when we come to Christ for salvation. What happens when Jesus takes over our life? And, of course, we are immersionists. There's no, we believe that. I've always believed that. If you have... If you may, turn, if you may, to uh, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6.
this, these scriptures I'm going to read go, pretty much go along with what I've just mentioned, what I'm talking to you about in Colossians. In Romans chapter 6, verse 3, the scripture says, Know ye not that so many of you were baptized in, to Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one spirit are we baptized into one body. Well, our body is the body of Jesus Christ. This baptism is pretty much the same baptism that I'm talking about in Colossians. Verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, going back to Colossians, going back to Colossians, I should mention that this baptism in the Spirit, baptism into Christ, is a one-time event. And what happens when we are baptized into Christ is our old, we identify with the death of Christ. Our old life has died with Christ. It's burned. And then we are spiritually resurrected with a new life, a life in Christ. And that's why the baptism by immersion is a better picture of what baptism is all about. When you dunk somebody on a little water, you're symbolizing your dead person, that person's identification with the death and burial of Jesus Christ. And when they come out of the water, that symbolizes they being spiritually resurrected from being spiritually dead through the work of Christ. It speaks of them identifying with the resurrection of Christ. So, uh, and this baptism that we see is through faith in the operation of God. It is faith in God and it's faith in his power. It's faith in his working. Now I want to say something what our faith should not be in. I'm getting a little bit away from the message. But I really think I need to say this. Our faith must be supremely in God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith cannot be in political systems or political parties. Our faith cannot be in economic systems, whether it be free market capitalism or socialist systems. Our faith cannot be in the way, way life used to be. Our faith cannot be in the military, and I support the military, but our faith cannot be ultimately in the military. Our faith cannot be ultimately in education. Our faith cannot be in any man or woman. Our faith cannot, must, cannot be in any church or denomination, as important as church is. Rather, our faith must be in God. God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, as we see in verse 12, and will one day resurrect our bodies well, after when our Lord comes again. It seems that a lot of believers had their faith in a political system or economic system. But our faith, no matter what, must be in God. And there's a lot of shaking going on. That's why it's important for our faith to be right on Jesus during this strange times that we're in. Okay. Then verse 13, the scripture teaches that we've been dead in our, that we were dead in our sins and the uncircumcision of our hearts. That's our life before Christ. Before Christ, we were spiritually dead, separated from God, without the eternal life that can only come through Christ. We were dead to the things of God. We were dead in trespasses, trespassing against God and his Lord. Holy Lord. 
And the uncircumcision of the flesh speaks of the spear in which the Son of God Christ operates. The good news is for the believer, they have been quickened, that is, they've been made alive spiritually together with Christ. We have eternal life through Jesus. And not only that, we have been forgiven uh, from all trespasses. When God forgave us, he didn't forgive us 95% of our sins. He didn't forgive us of 99%. He forgave all our sins. 1 John 1, 7 said, The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses it from all sin. It continues to cleanse from all sin. That word cleanseth is in the present tense. God is continually cleansing us folks from our sins. So this is a real encouraging message. Blouting out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailed it to the cross. All this stuff talking about was done at the cross. Now, to understand what the handwriting of ordinances meant, back in those days, a handwriting of ordinance was a statement written by a debtor in which he acknowledged his debts. You could say that the law of Moses was a handwriting of ordinances against us. The law said we were all sinners and we owe the debt to God for all our disobedience. And of course, this is a debt that we could not pay, no matter how good we try to be, nor how many good works we try to do. The law was against it. It said you were guilty of sin without giving us any power to obey it. However, God, through Christ's death on the cross, erased the certificate of indebtedness that we owe to God with Jesus paying our debt with his shed blood on the cross. Now the term nailed to the cross. Back in those days when a person was crucified, their crimes were written on the cross. That's what that meant. And Jesus he suffered in our stead for all our sins. Our violations of God's law were nailed to the cross of Jesus who paid the penalty for them all and satisfied God's wrath on our behalf. And that brings us to the last verse. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them open, triumphing over them. Now, the principalities and powers here are talking about demonic powers. Jesus, through the death of the cross, gained tremendous victory for us over demonic powers. The this verse is kind of kind of an illustration of what inspired this particular verse is, was the Roman victory marches that took place back in those days. When the Roman army won a great victory, when they came back home, they had a parade, a victory parade. And in the parade, they would have their captives follow them. And it was a very big celebration. But the captives that they had captured in the victory were pretty much put on display as, as uh, replicas of victory. And Christ stripped from the power of evil rulers their controls over men and women like us here who have come to Christ. Through his death, Resurrection and ascension, Jesus openly exhibited his victory over Satan's forces. We see in John 16 11 that 
Satan was judged. Satan was judged on the cross, and he will always, forevermore, be under the sentence of that judgment. On the other hand, through Christ, we who are believers in him have victory over the enemy. The scripture says in Romans 8, 37, Lay we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And there's one other verse I want, to, want you to turn to in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 14. And here, Paul is using that Roman army victory march that I talked to you about as an illustration of this point right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Now thanks be unto God who always calls us to triumph in Christ and make it manifest the Savior of his, of his knowledge by us in every place. Moses said, always caused us to try. But I don't feel like I got the victory. If you believe in Christ, you have the victory through Jesus. Not in yourself, but in him. But I don't feel all that righteous. It doesn't matter what you feel. If you're in Christ, you are clothed with his righteousness. You have been saved from your sins and you're on your way to heaven. I tell you, the truths that I've actually uttered here ought to make us shout and praise the Lord. These are great truths that I'm speaking to you this morning, this afternoon about. Not because I think so, but because it's true. It's true. And in closing, I want to share something that I, that I just really believe the Lord brought to my life as I was studying and reading the scripture. The scripture says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And I've been praying so much for the power of God. And then it's like the Spirit spoke to me through that scripture and mentioned, We already have the power. Jesus said that you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Acts 1 8. Well, guess what? The Holy Spirit is already upon us. So we have the power of God in our lives as believers. It doesn't make a difference whether we feel it or not. We do. We have the power of God in Hilltop Bible Church. When we come together, God by his spirit is here and we have the power of God. Now what we can pray for is what I prayed for out of Ephesians chapter 3. That God will strengthen us in the inner man by the Holy Spirit. But guess what? That Holy Spirit is already in us. So we have the power of a liveful God. What we need to pray for is that God give us boldness to stand for him. Boldness through the power of the Holy Spirit that we already have. So anyway, hope you're encouraged this afternoon. Hope those of you that see this online encourage whenever you see this message, hear this message. And let's go ahead and pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for the Holy Spirit to do its work. We are your people, called by your name, brought into a wonderful relationship, brought into fellowship with you, all because of your grace and mercy. And you have called us and equipped us and blessed us, not because we deserve it, but because you are gracious and you desire people that you can be glorified. Help us to walk in these truths in the days ahead. We give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen.